Well, good morning, church. Good morning, Welcome. Good morning. If you're online this morning, uh, shoot us a note in here so we know you're with us this morning. And uh, this is such a beautiful day outside. You couldn't want better weather. We should have yeah. uh, we should I think that's a great there. idea. Yeah. We'll just move all the chairs yeah, out in we'll the middle of the parking lot. And we can have church out there. The yeah, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Like Sounds that. fun. What did do? Well, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So we've got a lot of great things coming up here at Grace Street Church. This Wednesday at 7 o'clock, we're going to have the uh, Bible study on the shack. So that will be continuing on as we go through. And then coming up right after that, we have our next men's breakfast coming up the uh, first Saturday in June at 9 o'clock in the morning. Uh, always very, very good food and uh, uh, some good time together. So we're looking forward to that. Um, then... On June 14th, we have the flag retirement ceremony with the Sea Rabbits Freedom Festival. I just got the message here from the executive director of the Freedom Fest here probably about uh, five minutes ago. And uh, so everything is on and set and ready to go. Uh, they have 180 flags already folded and ready to go. And they're collecting all the names. Um, so if you haven't been to it before, um, as you can see, the, we, we have a fire pit in there and we retire a flag for each person, for each veteran who has passed away that past year. And then we read aloud, uh, Pastor Terry and I read aloud the names of each one of those people who has passed. Uh, it's going to begin at 6 o'clock with the singing of the National Anthem. And then we'll conclude with a moment of silence and the playing of taps. Uh, so this will be... No, this is going to be at uh, 4001 Center Point Road, Northeast. So we're moving it over to the Freedom Foundation, uh, to their new offices over there. So we're going to have it right there in their parking lot. Uh, so we'll not be at Kirkwood this year, and it won't be out at Open, or, uh, yeah. What was new that? Covenant. New Covenant. New Covenant, yeah. All right, then after that... <laughs> Uh, June 10th, we have, of course, Orange Track Racing in here. We're going to set up the Orange Tracks in here and have a lot of fun there. Then, starting on June 21st, we're going to start our uh, study on the Chosen. And uh, through that study, you're going to find a deeper look into the scriptures. There'll be video segments that go along with that. Um, and uh, we will be able to go through... Uh, all of the quotes, all of the different illustrations, and those kind of things in here for The Chosen. And, and if you've never seen anything with The Chosen before, uh, we've got season one, two, and three of The Chosen. And I highly recommend that we all get together and watch those. So then, coming up July 8th, can you believe that already? Jesus Revolution, the movie. And we're going to be showing it right here, so make sure you invite all your friends. We do need to get a head count ahead of time to make sure we have enough chairs set up in here um, and enough food. So uh, I expect that we should have a fairly decent turnout for that coming in here. And uh, that is an awesome, awesome movie and uh, very enlightening, I'd say the least. So we've got a lot of things coming up over the next month in here. And we have, uh, we'll have some of the movie ticket things probably printed up and ready to pass out here shortly. Um, but we do and will need to get a head count for that one. So, we'll what's that? We'll try. We'll, try. We'll, we'll do our best. We will do our best. Uh, so let's open up this time of worship with a word of prayer, shall we? Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we just come before you today and we just praise you and thank you for this beautiful day, for this awesome opportunity to gather here freely and openly in your presence. Lord, we thank you that uh, in your word it tells us that when two or more are gathered together in your name, there you are amongst us, and we welcome you here today. We welcome the Holy Spirit to come into our hearts today as well, and we ask that you would open our ears to hear the message that you have for us here today in word and in song. And Lord, we ask that you would open our hearts to receive that message and then give us the ability to live that message out as we go up back into the world after the service today. Lord God, we thank you that 
we have the opportunity to pray for those who can't be with us here today, who may be traveling or who may be ill, uh, injury, whatever it happens to be, that they're unable to be with us here today. We ask a special blessing on them as well today, and we lift them up to you. For those who are online, we lift them up to you as well, Lord. We would love to have them join us in person if they can at some point in time, but we thank you for having them and putting it upon their hearts to join with us here this morning as we open this time of worship. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. So the call to worship that Pastor Terry is, has chosen for this morning comes from Genesis 3, 8 through 10, and this comes from the New International Version. Then man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord. God among the trees in the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? And he answered, well, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And wow, what a change has happened here. If we remember when we talked about this time in the garden, it was a beautiful place before they disobeyed God and ate from the tree. Adam and Eve walked and talked with God in person. There was no sickness, there was no death, no fear, no shame, no guilt, no sin. It was a perfect place. It was literally paradise. But then they broke the covenant with God and they ate of the forbidden fruit and everything changed. Can you imagine what that was like? Paradise, harmony, and peace. No stress, bliss. Adam and Eve disobeyed the one rule that he set before them, and it all ended. Paradise lost. Now look at the world. What a mess we've made of paradise. See, in the movie, in the shack, when we saw that in the movie, we saw this beautiful garden, but it was a mess. Beautiful flowers and trees, plants of every kind. But the garden was a tangled up mess. Just like our world today is a tangled up mess. It's a beautiful place that God created for us. But what a mess we've turned it into. Well, Pastor Terry's going to give us God's message today so that we can find a way out through that garden and see how God sees us when we hide from so we look forward to the message that God has laid upon his heart. Lord, we just ask that you would bless Pastor Terry as he gives that message today. We just ask that you would embolden him and enable him to give that word and the message that would speak to our hearts and resonate with our souls so that we can take it out into the world with us each and every day. In your name we pray. Amen. careful not turning my mic on too soon because that's coming along with the music. Well, good morning. It's good to see you all this morning. Our sermon title this morning starts off, How Does God See Me? And I spent last night just kind of doing a little bit of uh, touch-up, if, if you will. And overnight, I would... we talk about this a lot. We get attacked by Satan a lot. And overnight, I was attacked. In the middle of my sleep, I slept very, very well. However, I had a terrible nightmare. A nightmare so bad that I was weeping and, and sobbing and, and crying out loud. And I prayed that I don't think I woke Diane up. But I was in a prison. And then I got ushered down to a ceremony or a service. And in that room were other prisoners like myself, but also all of the pastors that I know from 
Cedar Rapids were there. And they were ministering to each and every person. And the, this question was hitting me, how does God see me? How does God see me? He sees me as a pitiful sinner. And then someone came over, and I don't remember the face that it was, I don't remember the words that were even said, but I know they were words of encouragement, and they were words that pulled me up and out of that dream, out of that nightmare. Because basically what I heard, or the gist of what I heard was, God sees you as redeemed. And that, that whole piece with being in a prison and everything, I'm sure part of that had to do with a TV show that we watched this week, I'm sure. Um, we, I know one of them this week where one of the, uh, well, it's CSI Vegas, and one of the CSIs, gets arrested at the very end of the season finale. So it's this cliffhanger till next fall. And he is arrested for doing something unspeakable. And so I'm sure that kind of played into it. But in, as I woke up and I was sitting there laying in bed, staring at the ceiling in the dark, I thought of this garden that we saw in the movie. And it was a beautiful garden. Have you ever planted a garden? And gardens can be so wonderful to look at. It may have been something as small as a flower pot or, or even a little herb garden. Or if you remember, some of us might remember going all the way back to our elementary or preschool days where we'd come home with that styrofoam cup full of dirt and there's nothing coming out of it yet because we had taken that seed and pushed it in with our little finger and we brought it home for mom to help mom and dad to help us get it to, to come out. And eventually it would pop up. And right now, um, we bought Diana a, uh, for Mother's Day. We got her a, a nice raised garden bed uh, sitting on her back deck. And she had uh, taken and we had some strawberries left over from dad's service. So she scraped the outside of one of the, some of the strawberries and she planted those. And then we bought some peas and she planted those. And what, day before yesterday, I think it was, we went out to take a look and she got so excited because there's a little bit of green coming up where those peas are. It was so exciting to see that and how that, and it was just, you know, the dry little seed and all of a sudden, poof, we got something growing out of it. Now, sometimes when we plant a garden, they die because, you know, maybe we didn't push the seed down far enough or it didn't get enough water or it's in too much sunlight or whatever it may be. But it can be difficult to grow that garden, but it also can be so very rewarding. We've taken the, the strawberry plants from the last couple of years because we didn't have this raised garden bed and we put them out in this little area in our back uh, yard. And I made Diane put her shoes back on Friday after she'd got taken them off from work. And I said, come with me. And we went out and here's this little strawberry section out there with these beautiful white buds on them. I said, now if the animals don't get to these, we'll be good. <laughs> we'll have some strawberries on there this year. It's so fun to watch this miracle of growth as it breaks through the dirt. And it takes patience. We have to water it. And that little spot out in the back, it's there's weeds around it and all kinds of other things. So it's a constant battle to keep that weeded and cleaned out. And Diane's been using it. We make coffee on the weekends because during the week we're up at different times. So during the weekends we make a pot of coffee and save those grounds. I got to think, got to save those grounds because those are going to go out into the race garden. But now that they're starting to come up, now comes the more difficult part of gardening because now they're starting to appear. Now they're coming out of that dirt and they need a little bit more uh, care. And, and it seems counterintuitive, but sometimes we have to pull out things that are going. You gotta make sure it's not the plant that you planted, which can be kind of hard when you have no idea what's going on. You're just, you know, hobby farmers, you know, you've got your 
0.001 acre farm they're going on, but we're thinning it out and making a way for that growth to mature. And it's a purposeful space, but without that purposeful space, there's no room for it to grow and to bear peas in one case or fruit in another. Well, actually, it's going to be, yeah, that'd be fruit. Never mind. But as we get ready to watch this next clip from the movie, The Shack, we're going to see the main character, Mac, as he's invited into a garden of sorts. And kind of to set this up, this is following the clip we watched a couple weeks ago where Mac is mad at God, they're, where they're kneading the bread. And, and he storms out of that conversation with Papa. And he is ticked. He's angry. He's upset. And it seems that he's had enough of the shack and this very strange encounter. He is just done. He wants to get away from it. And, but let's watch what happens next. Thanks. Just to be clear, we're not justifying anything. We'd like to heal it. If you let us. Before you go, there's something in the garden I was hoping you could help me with for tomorrow's celebration. Celebration. If you want to know, Mr. Grant. Mac's going to stick around a little bit longer. Now, two weeks ago, we tackled the question, where is God when I need him the most? And we explored the paths of directing our honest questions to God and encountering him in the midst of our pain. This week, we're going to explore the question, how does God see me? Now, when you think about that question, what kind of emotions does that stir up for you? Hope? Joy? Confusion, doubt, fear, a whole host from one end of the spectrum to the other. And for too many of us, guilt and shame are potentially the strongest responses that come from this question. How does God see me? And it's probably no surprise to any of you that this is even a question that Christians, followers of Jesus, struggle with. Because they think, well, Satan gets in, you know, we got to, Satan gets his foot in the door there, and like he did with me last night in that dream. It's easy to fall into that trap. And it's a very uneasy feeling when we start thinking about the fact that God can see straight into our soul, right into us. We don't want to let God in because of that because we're afraid of what he will find in the dark corner. Some are afraid that he'll be angry or that he'll punish us for what he finds in our hearts. Some of us may be afraid that he can't really help or do anything about the hurt that we've experienced. Some are just outright mad at him, blaming him for the pain that we have gone through. Yet for some, it's a little bit of all of those things. In many ways, we're a lot like Adam and Eve, and that's why I picked that passage for the call to worship this morning. But I want you to look and hear it in a different version. This comes from the Amplified Bible. It says, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool afternoon breeze of the day. So the man and his wife hid and kept themselves hidden from the presence of the Lord 
God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you walking in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid myself. Just like Adam, is it possible that we have the wrong perspective? Could it be that God can see beauty in the mess? Now, if any of you are old school Super Chick fans, you might be, remember their album, Beauty from Pain, where they kind of go into all of this in that album. There is beauty in that mess. There is beauty in that pain. It's a beautiful mess. As we saw in the garden, as Mac and and Sarah, you walked into the garden. It was beautiful. It was a mess. Mac and Sarah, you had a very different view of what that mess was. What is it that you noticed when they left the forest and walked into the garden? Mac tries to say wild as he's pushing aside all the blooming tropical growth. But when Sarah you pushes him a bit more, he says, okay, it's a mess. To him, everything looked wild and overgrown. It was beautiful, but it lacked any sense of order. And if you're like me, or if you're like Mark, you like order. Everything has to be in order. This chaos is no fun. Sarah, you agrees that it is a mess, but she sees it in a different way, a different view. She says, so beautiful, as she admires that garden. To better understand that, what she is seeing in this garden, let's go back to the very first one. So in Genesis 1, 27 and 28, as well as 31, we read, So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. And then in verse 31, it continues and says, Then God looked over all he had made. All. Not just a little bit, but all. And he saw that it was very good. And evening passed and morning came, making or marking the sixth day. These verses give us a view of the garden through God's eyes. Sarah, Sarah, you saw the garden that they walked into in different view, through different lens, through different eyes than Mac did. So the questions come to me is, how did God see Adam and Eve? How, did, how does God see or view humanity? How does God see or view each of us. And that comes from the end of that first sentence in verse 31 where it says, very good. Now some of you may be thinking that this was all before Adam and Eve disobeyed God, and you are correct, it is before that happened. But disobedience and sin brought consequences. And I, I think it was on Wednesday night, it was mentioned that what if they had said they were sorry? Would that have changed the consequence? Would it have been less severe? An interesting question to think about. But God's perfect order was broken, and that included that face-to-face -face unity with him. We lost that at the time of the fall. It brought a separation between a holy God and a fallen humanity. But did it change God's view of each of us? Because we are the pinnacle of his creation, did it change his view? Well, we need to look to the Bible to answer that. Let's look at Psalm 30, 139, verses 13 and 14, as well as 17. For you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. 
How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Understanding this was written after the fall. Verse 17 continues and says, How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Now let's jump to Isaiah 43, 4, where it says, Others were given in exchange for you. I traded their lives for yours because you are precious to me. You are honored and I love you. This is God speaking through the prophet Isaiah, saying that we are honored. He loves us. We are precious. What wonderful descriptions that we read here in this passage from Isaiah. We are precious. We are honored. We are loved. Sounds a lot like what we read from that passage in Genesis. We are very good. Jesus conveys a similar perspective in Luke 12, 6 and 7, talking about the detail and precision of God's care for his creation, which includes us. Jesus says, what is the price of five sparrows? Two copper coins? Yet God does not forget a single one of them, and the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are more valuable to God than a whole flock of sparrows. The Apostle Paul later describes God's lavish love for us this way in 1 John 3, 1. See, excuse me, John says this in 1 John 3 and 1. See how very much our Father loves us, for he calls us his children, and that is what we are. But the people who belong to this world don't recognize that we are God's children because they don't know him. God sees the beauty in each of us despite how messy we look. Now, I'm not talking about your outside. I'm talking about the inside. When sin and evil broke, came into a, and caused a broken world, God already had a plan to restore it. He had a plan to restore what he had originally intended. What we see as chaos, he had a plan. Everything in order. He never stopped seeing the goodness of his creation. Instead, he put into motion his plan to restore and redeem us. Think of, uh, think of us being like a diamond in the rough, or we're a buried treasure. Maybe we're a gemstone that just needs to be polished. A fixer-upper, if you will garden in need of some serious TLC. Pick your metaphor. The point is the same. When God sees you, he sees the beauty of what he created, and he wants to fully reveal that, not just to you, but to each and every person that has lived and will ever live. So beautiful, he said. So look at, let's look at this. We're abiding in Christ. How through a, how? So how do we abide in Christ? Through a relationship between himself and each of us. That's the way it all began in Eden. God visited and walked and talked with Adam and Eve face to face. Can you imagine being able to walk and talk face to face with the Creator? Just this past uh, Wednesday, I found out that my uncle Ken had passed away. Dementia after well, Alzheimer's to be more specific. When my uncle called and told me about it, he said he is now with Jesus. He is now in the presence of God. He now, so now when I think, you know, read this, I'm thinking now he is able to walk and talk and be face to face with God. But if we drop back to that time frame, then then there was the snake oil that that serpent sold Adam and Eve. And yes, that is an intended pun. Let's look at Genesis 3, 5 from the Amplified Bible where it says, For God knows that on the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened. That is, you will have greater awareness and you will be like God knowing the difference between good and evil at its very core the lie claimed that they did not need God that they could be like God 
that they could do it all on their own. It's a lie that the world just dwells in. Their choice to believe this lie is what drove a wedge into a perfect relationship. Think about relationships that you've had in your life and the lies that drove a wedge into them. This is the same lie that we face each and every day. You'll be like God. You don't need him. You can judge what's right or wrong. Your truth is your reality. You can follow the path that seems best or easiest or the most fun or the most convenient. Here's the thing. That might work for a while, but what happens when millions of people follow the choices that feel best to themselves? I think of some of these highways, like in these big cities, where you got all these off ramps that are going all different directions. How about this question? What happens when my right contradicts your right? My good opposes your good. What happens? Conflicts arise, wars are waged. Brokenness multiplies exponentially. This is not how God meant for it to be. If we remember back from the movie and we go beyond this clip that we just watched, Mac and Sarah, you discuss these very ideas as they work together in the garden. She says, you weren't meant to do any of that all on your own. This was always meant to be the fruit of a relationship, a conversation between friends. Friday morning, I'm sitting there going, doing my morning devotions. It's about 10 to six. And all of a sudden I have a video call on Messenger. And I look at it and it's a coworker and it's like, Oh, God, what, what's going on? I answer it. It's a friend from work. And he's struggling. He's trying to do it all on his own. And he finally, he said, I saw you were online, and I just had to call you. He says, I'm struggling. I don't know what to say to God. I don't know what to pray for. He is, so my friend is like the third. His grandfather is senior. His grandfather is 92 and has terminal cancer. He's not getting treatment for it because he wants to have quality of life. And so soon the cancer will ultimately end his life shorter than what my friend wants it to be. And to top that, then grandma, Grandpa's wife has Alzheimer's and doesn't have a clue what's going on. He is her caretaker. He's swirling in all of this. What do I say to God? Do I, do I pray to God that my uncle or my grandfather is healed? What am I doing? And just, it was question after question after question. And I'm thinking of this, this whole message, this whole series that we're doing. I said, it's a conversation. And he looked at me kind of quizzically and I said, how are we talking right now? You're bearing your soul to me. You're telling me how exactly how you feel. I said, there's an extremely good example of this in the scriptures. Turn to the Psalms. Look what David wrote. See how he cried out to God, how he literally almost like screamed at God and, and said, why, why, why? But then he goes and he honors God and he, he realizes who God is and that God is totally in control. This is the kind of conversation you are able to have with the creator. These 
these are the kind of things that we can look to God for. And he, when he looks at you, how is he going to see you? He's going to see you as a, his hurting child. So the next question I have for you is, have you ever viewed your relationship with God as a conversation that is just like it is between friends? He desires an organic, living, breathing, constant, life-giving relationship with us. We don't have to be like the religious leaders of Jesus' day or even some of the religious leaders of today or people of today that they give these eloquent prayers, these awesome, long prayers. Not that there's any wrong thing wrong with the prayers, and I will admit I may have coveted how some people can pray in the past, but then I go back to this. It's just a conversation. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. It's an ongoing, intimate dialogue with God as he helps us navigate the choices and challenges that we encounter every moment of every day. It's a resting reliance on his loving affirmation and healing presence in our pain and in our confusion. It's a willing trust in his ability to do what is best in us and for us. Jesus offers us a beautiful garden-related metaphor of what this relationship can look like. It is an abiding, remaining, staying connected to our life-giving source and drawing everything we need from him. This is what he says. Let's look at John 15, 1 and 4. He says, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Now, when we think of uh, this pruning process, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing the little shears and it's cutting a little piece of the branch off. It's like, that would hurt. That would hurt a lot. You know, cutting hurts. But in the context of what Jesus said, does it hurt to cut off a dead branch? We need to clean out or clear out the old withered remains to make room for new growth. All winter long, we had kept uh, Anne's flowers by our back sliding door. And a few times a week, I would go and I would break off the brown leaves, snap off the wilted petals, and it would come back. And so what we were able to do then was the other day, Diane was able to take it back to her. And now it hangs on the little hook outside of her window and it's growing again. It's, God is taking care of it now. But it was making room for new growth. Yes, pruning can be painful, but it's not always. Do you know what we prune on ourselves? Well, most of us. Our hair. Or our fingernails. And what happens? Well, for most of us, the hair grows back. It gets longer. Fingernails get longer. They regrow. But there's no pain. The only pain in cutting your fingernails is you know, when you miss and you get a little bit of the fingertip on there. Or if you were like me when I was a kid, my mom was, she had the, the Sears uh, grooming kit. It had the little razor and the scissors and everything that she bought, right? And she's cutting my hair down in the basement and she snipped a piece of my ear. That was the last time she cut my hair. That was her choice, not mine. She didn't want to hurt me again. Because, you know, that, that little bit of pruning did hurt just a little bit.
but it's a process of regeneration. Things regrow. Jesus was talking about a regenerative process in this passage, remaining, abiding in him, drawing nutrients and sustenance and life from him so that fruit can naturally grow out of us. That's why we come together on Sundays to get rejuvenated for the week. That's why we come together on Wednesdays to Bible study together and pray together. That's why we are always encouraging you to spend time with God by yourself during the week, reading God's Word. It's a way that we get those nutrients and sustenance for our lives. Perhaps our view of the process comes back to the question of how we view the gardener. How do we view God? Can I trust him? Is he really there for me? Is his love truly good? Does he really find me beautiful? Mess and all. Well, God has a higher vision. God is inviting us into a true restorative relationship. Jesus gave words to this, and he says this in Matthew 11, 28 and 30. Then Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I, I will give you rest. Not the world, Jesus will give you rest. He says, take my yoke upon you, let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Now the Jews that he was speaking to at that time would have a very good idea of what he was talking about when he talks about a yoke. As a kid, when I heard this passage, I was like, yoke? That's like an egg? Yeah, exactly, Jane. I'm thinking egg yoke. But he's talking about this a double harness, a wooden double harness that two animals such as oxen or cows would be connected with and they would be over there around their necks and they would then be able to pull together at the same time making the process of what they were doing whether that was plowing a field or doing whatever much simpler because there were two of them doing it instead of just the one Jesus' invitation is to share the load as he walks beside us, teaching and guiding us with gentleness and comfort through pain and uncertainty. So who is better to be partnered with? As we walk with him, we can trust that God has a bigger vision, a deeper understanding, a transformative purpose in our lives. When we can't see beyond our emotions and our circumstances, we can actually cling to the hope because he can. Because we are yoked together with him, he will help us move forward. Isaiah gives us assurance that God has a much bigger perspective than we do, and his words are a beautiful promise that we can cling to. Looking at Isaiah 55, 8 and 11, my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. The rain and snow come down from the heavens and stay on the ground to water the earth. They cause the grain to grow, producing seed for the farmer and bread for the hungry. It is the same with my word. I send it out, and it always produces fruit. It will accomplish all I want it to, and it will prosper everywhere I send it. When we look through God's lens, we're able to see more clearly because he sees so much more clearly than we can or than we do. His perspective is eternal. We have a, this really good way of looking at things in a finite way. Blinders on, if you will. His understanding is infinite. We can never fully grasp the spiritual realities that are at work until we enter God's presence in heaven. 
Now I shared with Mark a, a YouTube channel not too long ago. It is uh, this person that runs this channel. He puts Bible verses in an artificial intelligence generator. And he put one of an angel in and you know, we think of angels as the cute little angels, you know, dressed in the white robe. These angels that this AI generator created were warriors. And the, the imagery is absolutely beautiful. It's beyond our understanding sometimes that the angels that are out there are not just cute little cherubs, but that they're warriors. And if they are warriors, imagine what God is. How much further beyond that is. It's a spiritual reality that we have trouble grasping. Now, we can accept his invitation and trust that he is working to transform us from the inside out. That is a wonderful invitation to accept. Now, there's another great line in the shack that Sarah you says later in the scene we watched where she says, wild and wonderful and perfectly in process. Magnificent. I couldn't share this on Wednesday night because we had someone who hadn't seen the movie yet, but that garden, that wild, bed, beautiful mess, that was Max. was Max Garden, that beautiful mess. And he saw it as a disordered mess. She saw it as beautiful, magnificent, and in process. What a wonderful, beautiful description of ourselves. This is how God sees us perfectly in process. So I have some questions for you before we end the message this morning. Nobody has to answer them. Just think about them. Talk to God about them. Will we join him in that transformation that he wants to lead us through? Will we turn to him and allow him to align our hearts to his? Will we experience the beauty he wants to nourish in our lives? His invitation is there for us. The last question is, will you take it? Father God, you see us as beautiful in process. You see us as magnificent. Even when we see ourselves in the worst of situations and we can't see a way out, you see how wonderful we are because we are made in your image and you said very good and we know from your teachings, from your son, from your scriptures, your love letter to us, that it doesn't say this in the Bible, but you don't make any junk, Lord. You never have and you never will. We need to begin to see our lives as beautifully magnificent and in process and allow you to work through us and in us as we bring order into that metaphorical garden that is our lives. Thank you, Father, that you see us as magnificent. In Jesus' name. Pastor Terry, as we come into this time of communion this morning, I have a few things I want you to ponder on a little bit. As the scriptures tell us, the word became flesh and walked among us, and that's what Christ did. And in doing so, God availed himself the opportunity to see man at his best and at his worst. And so he could see his creation, which he created and was good. And he could see how far they have fallen. And in doing so, then, 
Jesus had the opportunity to see exactly what it was going to take to make amends for how far men had fallen. And that's what I want you to think about today because, see, that's, what, that's why he went to the cross. is because we have become fallen. He could walk among us and he could see, yes, we have redeeming qualities. Yes, we can be brought back. I mean, you take a look at Paul and he... And if a person can ever change, you know, Saul of Tarsus, who was going out and persecuting and killing Christians. And then God called him out of that. And he was transformed from being one of the worst sinners you could imagine to one of the best and being a warrior for Christ. And that's why Christ went to the cross. Because no matter what we do, he paid the price so that we can be redeemed on that cross along with him. We die a death to our sins and our sinful nature and to what we have fallen into through Christ who brings us up and out and makes us a new creation in him. So I want you to think about that as we're taking communion this morning. And on the night that that Christ was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body which is broken for you. Take and eat. Likewise, later in the meal, he took a cup and after he had filled it, he blessed it and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant, my blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. And as the scriptures tell us, it goes on to tell us that he will not eat of this meal again or drink of this cup again until he comes back to bring us home to himself. So we are a work in progress, just like the messy garden. The mess is all the sin in our lives, all the stuff that we separate us from God. But see, it's a, it's a beautiful mess still is the mess that God created and it's still good so think about that today the body of Christ broken for you take and eat the blood of Christ shed for you take and drink thanks be to God so we come to the time of, of prayers in here this morning and I know that we had quite a few prayers uh, online and we have uh, some sheets on the back table as well from Wednesday night. Is there anyone other than what's listed on those sheets that needs to be lifted up here this morning? Okay, well, let's go to God in prayer, shall we? Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we just praise you and thank you that you make all things new. No matter how dirty or ash-like we become, you see the beauty within us no matter what. We praise you and thank you for that. We thank you for the healing process that you've done in the lives of so many and those who are on our list that you are doing a healing within them. Sometimes we don't understand what healing needs to take place. But we just pray to you, Lord, that your will be done and that your healing take place in those people's lives. Lord, for those who can't be with us here because they're traveling, we ask for travel mercies upon them to bring them back home safely, safe and sound, and back into our family here at church. Lord, we thank you that, you know, we don't understand your ways throughout our lives, but your ways are always good. Help us to understand. Open our ears to hear and listen. Open our hearts to accept that message that you want to put on our hearts today and to be a resource for others, to help those who can't help themselves. Lord, help us be your hands and feet. Enable us, embolden us to take those steps forward for other people and not just ourselves. We praise you and thank you for this opportunity to gather here together today for the message that you bring to us in both word and song. In your precious name,
you that are watching online, look for the link to the videos for this morning's worship. The songs I picked this morning, Knowing You by Graham Kendrick. God knows us. Another one, Known. I love Torn Wells. Then there was one from Hillsong Worship that says, Who You Say I Am. And then finally for King and Country's God Only Knows. It, I know it's fun. For, I, we, we look forward to the day that we have a live worship team again. We look forward to the day where we have a worship leader who's picking the, the music for each Sunday. But right now I know how much fun it is for us to pick songs that speak to us because these messages are speaking directly to us as well. One of the, the lines out of the very first song says, to possess by faith what I could not earn, all suppressing gift of righteousness. God sees that beautiful mess. So hear this prayer and this benediction as we close out this part of our service. God, thank you that your ways are not our ways. Thank you that you see us as your beautiful creation. Thank you for seeing our lives and our whole world from a different and much clearer perspective. Father, please draw us to you each and every day. Draw us into that transformative relationship that we have only through you. Weave that transformation into our lives, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. I hear what Paul read, uh, wrote in Ephesians 3, 20 and 21, and this comes from a different version than we normally use. It's called the Pan Passion Translation. It's a translation that currently is only Psalms and Proverbs and the New Testament. It's a little bit different than the scriptures that we normally use and not quite as far uh, into the storytelling as the message, but somewhere in the middle there. And he writes, never doubt God's mighty power to work in you and accomplish all of this. He will achieve infinitely more than your greatest request, your most unbelievable dream, and exceed your wildest imagination. He will outdo them all for his miraculous power constantly energizes you. Now we offer up to God all the glorious praise that rises from every church and every generation through Jesus Christ and all that will yet be manifest through time and eternity. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.